you all got quiet, so I guess it's time to start. Thank you very much. Um, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, our presenters, the community members, just everybody. This is wonderful to see, see you all. Um, a very special thanks to Christy and Tiffany for their, um, they're from REMAX Alliance and for their community support of tonight's community meeting, the Wildfire Symposium. And then we also want to thank um, My Mountain Town for videographing tonight, and then also for Conifer Jazzercise for water. It may, there may still be some water back in there, back there if somebody needs it. Um, a link will be available um, probably in the next day or two um, for you to enjoy the meeting all over again um, and for a lot of people to see it for the first time. So be watching for that link and if your name is on the Conifer Area Council email list, which I think some of you signed up for tonight, then you will be getting that link for that meeting. Um, most of you have been to Conifer Town Hall meetings um, probably several times. If you haven't, there is no campaigning and there's no comments or questions during the presentations. And the reason we do that is we have a lot of speakers um, talking about very, very important things. Um, and you can go up to them and ask questions afterwards during the second open house. So if you could just remember that. Um, one more thing to remember is um, cell phones. If you have a cell phone here tonight, be sure and get it out because we're going to do some polling in a little bit and you'll be asked some questions. Wildfire. This is the m number one critical issue f facing us here in the Conifer area. Preparedness, response, recovery are all so important. Federal, state, and local agencies have been working together to help reduce the risk and to be ready in case it happens. So homeowners, and as homeowners, we need to know what, to, what is being done, what opportunities are out there for us, and how important our individual roles are. So each of us plays an extremely important part in wildfire. To what, together we can and we will make a difference. So first of all, we have Colorado State Senator Tammy Story to talk about wildfire legislation. Tammy. Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see so many turn out tonight for this uh, wildfire symposium. I'm Senator Tammy Story, and I represent Senate District 16 right now. That includes the mountains of Jefferson County, west of C-470, and west of Highway 93 from Golden to Boulder, more or less. It bleeds over a little bit on both sides. Um, also, southern Boulder County, Superior, El Dorado Springs, and Eldora all of Gilpin County, and then the southwest corner of Denver County. Um, and so I'm delighted to see more, so many of you out here. I um, sit on a number of different committees uh, during the session, but in the interim, the last couple of years, I have sat on the Wildfire Matters Review Committee, and we are wholly focused on wildfire issues during that um, committee during the in, uh, interim, which is not during session. And uh, we meet with numbers of stakeholders, both state agencies and, and non-governmental agencies, organizations that are focused on conservation, uh, whether it's wildlife or um, our, our um, trees and forests and so forth, and other entities that are um, you know, very interested in, in what goes on with our wildfires and how we work to better contain them, et cetera. Um, and, so this has been a great opportunity uh, for those of you that have lived up here. You're probably well aware that the Conifer Evergreen area is the top risk area in our state for wildfire, um, and it is among the top 10 in the country. Um, so there has been a lot of focus on that issue um, in the legislature over the last couple of years. We've invested a lot of funding in um, various um, efforts to help um, better prepare for our next wildfire season. And I'm sure all of you know that we have been incredibly lucky uh, this year 
um, during what is typically our fire season to have had such minimal impacts from wildfires here this year. The skies have been blue all summer. It's been absolutely fabulous out there, but we know it's not going to last and we want to be better prepared for the next uh, fire season that we have here in Colorado. So, um, I uh, again, I just want to share just a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, you know, our, our Colorado forests and our open spaces here is the reason why many of us live up here in the foothills and here in the state of Colorado. It's a huge driver, um, our economy, the, our open space in our parks is a huge driver for our economy and our outdoor way, um, way of life. But we have all witnessed climate change that's happening and it is impacting the um, wildfire season. It's making um, our fires more intense, more unpredictable, and much more destructive. And we've seen that. We've seen what happened during the Marshall Fire last year in December. Um, almost 1,100 homes burned in a suburban neighborhood, basically, two of them, um, in Superior and Louisville. And it was incredibly devastating. And nobody believed that we would have a fire of that kind of magnitude in the winter, in December. But we know now that um, we can have wildfire season year round and that it can be incredibly destructive whenever it happens. So that's why Colorado legislators have rolled up our sleeves and we've gotten to work to keep communities safe by improving how we prepare and respond to these catastrophic fires. And it's very essential that we act now and continue to work towards mitigating future climate-induced disasters and improve our response to the disasters left in their wake. Our work this past session has been focused on better coordinating our response and ensuring we're as prepared as possible when disaster strikes. We've also provided unprecedented financial relief to wildfire survivors like the Marshall Fire and responsibly invested funds to give Colorado communities and first responders more tools to fight these fires in the immediate future, helping prevent small flames from becoming destructive wildfires. Moving forward, Colorado legislators are focused on building our fire resiliency, filling the gaps left by underinsurance, and making Colorado as prepared as possible for the next time wildfires do strike here in our state. So a number of bills that I could highlight and just some basic topics. We passed legislation to invest $10 million in a matching grant program to help local governments develop and fund sustainable forest management and wildfire mitigation efforts. And we are working closely with Jefferson County um, officials, the county commissioners, Leslie Dahlkemper I know is here tonight, Commissioner Dahlkemper, and we have collaborated with them to help make that a reality. Um, we also want to extend the current income tax deduction that was created um, and a new state income tax credit for wildfire mitigation expenses for up to $625 a year and develop a statewide carbon accounting framework. Um, we allocated $7.2 million to wildfire mitigation grant programs and expand wildfire mitigation outreach and awareness campaigns. And that awareness campaign is super important because we are collaborating with the Colorado State Forest Service as well as the U.S. Forest Service and the Colorado Department of Fire Prevention and Control to build out a more, much more robust uh, May wild, um, Wildland Fire uh, Awareness Month. And so I think you should anticipate that there will be much more out there about that program, and I hope you will be watching for it and participate in those um, efforts as well. Um, another bill that uh, we worked on was to provide more resources and supports for our volunteer firefighters, for our fire departments that are here tonight. 80% um, of our firefighters in Colorado are volunteers. 80% of them. And in many cases, they foot their own bill for all of their personal protective equipment. Their boots, their pants, their jackets, their helmets, their gloves. They pay for it themselves and then they go out there and risk their lives to help protect our properties and save our lives. And so we um, drafted and passed a bill to provide funding for our volunteer firefighters to have, um, be able to purchase 
their uh, protective equipment without it coming out of their pockets. And it also provides uh, mental and behavioral health services as well for our volunteer firefighters. I'm out of time. I could talk for you for the whole night, to you for the whole night. Um, but I appreciate you all being here. And there's lots of folks to hear from. And I appreciate all of your support in the work that we do. Have a great night. Thanks, Tammy. Um, I'd like to let you know also that Colin Larson, state representative, is also here tonight. and. Um, right there, and you can talk to him during the open house also about, you know, whatever he's doing um, as far as legislation for wildfire. So, um, thanks, Colin, for coming. Um, next, we have Commissioner Michael Conway with the Colorado State Division of Regulatory Agencies. He's going to be talking about homeowners insurance as it relates to wildfire. Michael. Good evening, folks. Um, so I have five minutes. There's a very big sign telling me that I have five minutes, um, which means I'm about to condense what is usually about a 20 or 30 minute conversation into five minutes about what we learned coming out of the Marshall Fire. So Senator Story touched on the underinsurance issues. So the Marshall Fire hit December 30th uh, last year, and it hit about 10 o'clock early in the morning. By the end of that day, we had lost just shy of 1,100 homes. Um, and we knew right off the bat that one of the challenges that we were likely going to have was that we were going to have folks that were simply underinsured. And what I mean by underinsurance is that they weren't going to have enough insurance proceeds from their claims in order to rebuild the homes. We didn't know the magnitude of what the hole was going to be, but we, f we felt pretty confident that there was going to be a problem. And we were confident in that based upon conversations that we had had with regulators in other states that had gone through similar issues with homeowners from our own state that had gone through disasters before, fire disasters before the Marshall Fire. But this time we wanted to get data. Um, we wanted to get data and see how big of a problem that we had. The numbers that I'm about to share with you all folks are, are kind of scary. Um, and they're, and I, I'm going to share them with you tonight because I'm really hoping that after tonight you're going to go and you're going to talk to your insurance broker, your insurance agent, and your insurance company to make sure that you have enough insurance coverage if the worst happens. Um, as Senator Story was talking about, we're still in the midst of fire season right now. Fire season in Colorado, for all intents and purposes, certainly goes through the fall. Um, and as we learned last year, it goes into the winter too if we have a dry winter. So the piece of information that we'll, we don't have from the insurance companies themselves is how much it's going to cost these folks to rebuild. But we can estimate how much it's going to cost to rebuild. And we did that by going out to the home builders associations throughout the state, having conversations with builders themselves to get a feel for how much we thought it was going to cost people to rebuild their homes after the fire. And we picked price points. So we, we picked a price point of $250 a square foot to rebuild, $300 a square foot to rebuild, or $350 a square foot to rebuild. And then we did some simple math, folks. We looked to see, based upon the insurance coverage that people had, the folks that lost their homes, those roughly 1,100 homes, how many of those folks were going to be underinsured at each one of those different price points. At $250 a square foot, folks, we were, were about 350 homes were underinsured of those 1,100 homes, so about a third of the homes. The amount that they were underinsured, this is an average amount. So it, would be, it depends upon each individual home. But the dollar amount is just shy of $100,000 that each one of those homes are going to be underinsured. So those homeowners are going to have to go out and find some other mechanism to close the gap. At $300 a square foot, we're just shy of 50% of the homes are going to be underinsured. About 500 homes are underinsured. The dollar amount that those people are underinsured was at about $160,000 per home. $160,000 these folks are going to have to go out and find a coverage gap. Senator Story talked about some of the great work that the legislature did um, in order to try and help close that gap, but it's not going to be enough to close the whole $160,000. So folks are going to have to go to the federal government to get FEMA assistance, they're going to go to the community, they're going to go through a lot of different avenues, but there's a substantial gap that these folks are going to have in order to, to be able to rebuild the home that they had. And then the last number, $350 a square foot. It was north of two-thirds of the homes where it will be underinsured if the cost to rebuild is $350 a square foot. The dollar amount for those homeowners, on average, was $240,000. $240,000 that these folks are going to have to figure out a way to close the gap themselves. So I can't urge you enough to go and have conversations with your agents. Do you, it's, a, it's, a simple, it's a simple mathematical formula. You look to see how much coverage you have. You divide that by the square footage of your home, and that'll tell you how much per square foot that you have to rebuild your home if the worst happens. 
And then you, if, you, if you feel like you've got a gap, if you feel like you don't have enough insurance coverage, you talk with your insurance agent, you talk with your insurance company about increasing your coverage and seeing how much that's gonna cost you if you need to go that route. But I can't urge you folks enough to do that, to go and have those conversations. Because now is the time that you need to have the conversations. You won't be able to have the conversations, obviously, once the fire hits, once the fire starts burning, it's too late. Um, so we're in the back of the room over here, myself and our Director of Consumer Services for the Property and Casualty Section, Bobby Baca. Um, she, we're going to be, both be here all night to answer your questions. Um, we're going to be working with the legislature on different ideas and different ways to help homeowners get information so that they understand what they need to be asking and where the under insurance gaps are in the, in the future. But you have the power right now to go and solve it, to, to at least start to solve the issues yourselves and have those conversations with your insurance company. So really, I can't, like I said, I can't urge you enough to go out and do that. We'll be here all night to answer your questions. Thank you very much for having us here and that's it for me. Thank you, Michael. Yes, very important. I think um, the Lower North Fork fire, um, if you've, uh, most of you have been here since then. I think that was 2011, and there were a lot of issues with, with insurance. So definitely talk to your insurance agent. Um, next, we have Commissioner Leslie Dalkamper, and she is a huge proponent of wildfire risk reduction, and she is involved, I think, in everything that there is to do with wildfire legislation and everything else. Leslie. Thank you so much, Shirley. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here with you this evening, and it's wonderful to see an incredible turnout for tonight's conversation. Huge thanks to the Conifer Area Council for hosting this timely and urgent conversation with our community. I'm Leslie Dahlkemper, one of your three county commissioners. I serve with Andy Kerr and Tracy Kraft Tharp. And I want to take you back, oh, it was about four or more years ago. And I wasn't a county commissioner at the time, but I knew that there was an urgent issue regarding wildfire in our foothills communities. And I wanted to learn more about it. And more specifically, I wanted to learn more about what the county was doing about this issue. So I reached out to a number of the fire chiefs in the foothills communities and asked them what they saw as the most pressing issues. And also, what was the role of the county in this work? Certainly the sheriff's office addressing issues of evacuation, our incredible open space team, tackling mitigation, and more. But were we operating in silos, or were we working together across departments like planning and zoning to help us determine what growth and development looks like in the wildland urban interface where fire risk is so high? What did that look like for open space in terms of enhancing and increasing mitigation and more? So the Board of County Commissioners, previous Board of County Commissioners, came together and we formed the first, the first ever wildfire task force. It brought together more than 30 experts and specialists in forestry, water, open space, planning and zoning, building codes, our fire chiefs came to the table, and many more to really sit down and tackle how we could develop stronger collaboration. And the Board of County Commissioners specifically asked the task force to look at mitigation. We wanted to get out in front of some of these issues. And we know mitigation is one of many strategies. It's not just mitigation, defensible space, or hardening homes. It really is a comprehensive strategic approach in our community to reduce wildfire risk. That task force came forward with several recommendations in three key areas. Enhancing the pace and scale of mitigation, identifying new resources to help reduce risk in our communities. And we also looked at how do we tackle things like biomass removal? You know, all that slash that we collect, what do we do with it? And so we have since addressed many of those recommendations and the recommendations really became the foundation for what you'll hear tonight from Tom Hobie with Open Space, or Heather with Planning and Zoning. I believe Avel Montoya is here. He's our Director of Development and Transportation. I also serve on the Colorado Fire Commission. I mention that because it's important that Jefferson County, I think, have a voice at the state level. And we also work very closely with Governor Polis, Senators Bennett and Hickenlooper, as well as Congressman Nagus on these issues. I was with them earlier today at Floyd Hill regarding the expansion of a major, it's going to be the largest transportation project in Colorado. 
And it's important that we work at all levels of government with our fire chiefs, with business leaders, with you, our community, and others to tackle these issues head on. We've done a lot in Jefferson County. You're going to hear more about that in just a moment. But we've, we've elevated our SLASH program, doubling SLASH collection, and I want to thank you for the tremendous amounts of SLASH that you have brought to us. In fact, I think Tom told the Board of County Commissioners we had such an incredible weekend that we, we actually had to say, hold on, we need to you know, hold that thought, we're going to come back and collect more from you because the, the response was so good. Thank you for that. We've also worked on planning and zoning codes. So if in Jefferson County you live in the WUI and you pull a building permit, maybe you want to replace your deck or your roof, we're going to ask that you use ignition resistant materials and we're also going to ensure that you have defensible space around your home because we know how critical those strategies are too as well to lowering wildfire risk. There's a lot more that we've done but I think what I'm most proud of is the collaboration and partnership with our fire rescue departments, with open space, with all of our partners across the board. Because thanks to those efforts, just this year alone, we were able to secure $8.1 million to tackle and help pay for these efforts and others moving forward. I'll mention finally at the state level, because I know Angela's given me time, the Colorado Fire Commission is going to be looking at a couple of uh, critical legislative pieces moving forward increasing the capacity around mitigation of people on the ground. We're also going to be looking at working with the timber industry to help with biomass removal, and there's much more to come. But I know I'll, I'll be here on a regular basis to share those updates with you. Thank you so much for all you do with us, your incredible partners in this work. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Leslie. So we have brought a bunch of experts here tonight together, um, countywide efforts and resources. Um, lot, lots being done, none of the, I'm sorry, done at the county level. And we have Tom Hobie, the director of Jefferson County Parks and Conservation here to um, facilitate that. Tom. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here to talk about this really important issue uh, to all of us. Uh, we've been talking to you now for uh, about half the time, and we'd like to hear from you. Um, so if you could get your smartphones out um, and uh, get your camera up and, and zero in on that QR code, we've got like three questions we want to ask you just to collect a little information from you. Uh, when I talked to Shirley about this, um, she emphasized the fact that really this is about uh, resources and assisting uh, private landowners, property owners, uh, in whatever it is you might need. And we want to ask you a couple of questions around that. So if you uh, can get your phones out, um, the, the code for this particular um, session is, is 27681282. Two seven six eight one two nine two. In case that's a little small for some, so no service. Oh, okay. We're gonna bag this. Um, it's it's. I so I have this technology jinx, and here it is manifesting. Um, so um, maybe we can send you the survey uh, afterwards with the uh, piece. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and proceed then with uh, our slides. Um, we'll pull those up in a second here. Um, so in, in our um, organization, Parks and Conservation in the county, uh, we have Jefferson County Open Space. We have Colorado State University Extension in Jefferson County. Um, we have a, a small and mighty group of folks uh, that work on something we call land stewardship resources. That is solely resources for uh, private property owners. And we have a website um, called TerraSource. And that website has a variety of information that you as property owners um, can, can investigate about water resources, about uh, wildfire mitigation, about wildlife, et cetera. Um, if you just Google Jeffco TerraSource, um, you'll get to that. Uh, we also, in, on our team, have uh, our invasive species management uh, group that manages um, both weeds and pests throughout the county on both public and private lands. 
So um, can I have the next slide, please? I, I forgot to grab the clicker. Let me do that. Thanks, Chris. So um, one of the things that Commissioner Dal Kemper was talking about is uh, there's a lot of great people and organizations doing a lot of great work out there. And we really wanted to bring that together in the pursuit of a number of grant resources um, that were coming about. Uh, some of those, the ones that Senator uh, Story talked about earlier, the state co-swap grants or Colorado Strategic Wildfire Action Program grants, uh, which we were successful in getting two of the $7 million statewide from that program to do a variety of things. So when we think about we think about wildfire, there's, there's three big pieces to this that, were, that Shirley mentioned earlier. And that's preventing catastrophic wildfire. And that's what this slide is about. It's about prevention of catastrophic wildfire. And note the distinction, not preventing wildfire because we know we live in the West and wildfire is going to occur. But how can we all work together to not have wildfires be uh, devastating like the Marshall Fire uh, or the Buffalo Creek Fire um, from the, both the natural and the built environment. Um, so these three lines of effort in, in really involve uh, people and structures, uh, fuel reduction, we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, as well as biomass recycling or better known as our SLASH program. So I'm happy to report that by working together internally and externally in the county and throughout the county with all of our partners, Sheriff's Office, fire agencies, the Jefferson Conservation District, and others, we've been able to pull together $8.2 million in funding uh, from various grants and matching funds to work in these three areas. So I'll talk about that real quick. Uh, protecting people and structures. I'm just going to skim over this because Heather, Heather Guthrless from our planning and zoning team is going to go into that in great detail. But you can see um, that's about a million dollars or 12% of that funding. Uh, and then you can see a variety of, of fuel reduction work. That's cutting down trees, basically. Um, and that, that effort is at uh, just short of $3.5 million or 41%. And then the balance is to really hone in and make our slash program even more convenient for you to use. Commissioner Dal Kemper mentioned uh, that you all have done a tremendous job this year. We've, we've doubled the number of days that that program is available to, for you to drop. We want to make that double it once again and make it two and a half times more days that are available by having uh, a couple of year-round sites or pretty much year-round sites uh, that would be available to you all to kind of spread out of the effort there. Um, so that is, uh, that's the uh, Jeffco Wildfire Safe um, effort. Um, next up, I want to uh, introduce Hal Grieb. Hal is our uh, Director of Emergency Services in the uh, Sheriff's Office, uh, or Emergency Management, I should say. And uh, Hal's going to talk to you a little bit about the efforts in the Sheriff's Office. Hal? Howdy. Um, I'm used to coming here because my son goes to school here, so I'm, I think I need to like talk to a teacher soon or something. So it's a little awkward to be here on this side of the house. So um, my name's Hal Grieb, again, a director of emergency management. Uh, I live just down the road in Pine Junction, so I'm a neighbor uh, with y'all. So I figured if uh, I'm going to move here from Florida, I'm going to move where the beauty is, but also understand there's a burden with that, right? That's why we're all here today. So I've been here about two years uh, next month. So I, I most recently came from Florida. I was a director of emergency management there. Uh, hurricanes are a little different than wildland fire, uh, but I often kind of talk about how uh, wildland fires are, are tornado timing with hurricane consequences. So it's, it's a little unique, but shares some similar needs, coordination efforts. And, so one of the unique things with Jefferson County, as, as Tom mentioned, is the wildland urban interface. And while I wear the sheriff's logo, my office is responsible for not just a hazard, but all hazard emergency management. That's actually a county responsibility. In the state of Colorado, the sheriff is the designated by state statute to be the fire warden. 
So we have 13 fire districts in the, in the county. So when any of the 13 fire districts need fiscal or resource support, they go to the sheriff's office for that, uh, that fire warden responsibility. With the emergency management responsibility being delegated to the uh, Board of County Commission, they transferred that administrative and bureaucratic responsibility to the sheriff to help ease the duplicate, you know, to help remove duplication of efforts, ease some of the bureaucratic and strategy. And so I kind of balance between the, the BCC responsibility and the sheriff's office responsibility. So in my office, I have a, a fire management officer. He's, he goes out to the wildland fire when requested by the fire districts and does a complexity analysis to see if we need to do additional resource support coordination. If the fire is escalated up, I have an emergency operations center at the sheriff's office that represents a cross section of geographic Jefferson County. I can spin up those, those uh, bureaucratic professionals and we do the consequence management for any hazard. So today we're talking about wildland fire hazard. So if you think about a ripple uh, from a splash in water, my job is not the splash zone, but the consequences that cascade outside of the incident. So when you have a uh, wildland fire happening, the, wild, uh, the sheriff's office and the fire districts are the responders. They're the one in the splash zone. They're the ones sending out the emergency notifications through Jeffcom. They're the ones deciding where the evacuation routes should, or more importantly, should not be. And then we in the Emergency Operations Center are beginning to spin up uh, additional notification, PIO uh, messaging, uh, shelter uh, capabilities, resource support to push into the emergency and begin to help support again the ripples that cascade out of that. Some of the additional ripples, we're talking a lot about uh, defensible space, mitigation efforts, and some of the pre-incident work. I also have to manage and navigate the, the short to midterm recovery efforts. What happens after the fire? What do we do with the short term housing needs? What do we do with the recovery reimbursement needs? How do we get state and federal assets in and navigate those through the county operations to make sure we can help our community not just recover to the way it was, but to a better standard moving forward. And that's some of the things that you see through the Marshall Fire or any of the other historic fires that, that, you're, that we've all experienced in the news or in, even personally. So what does that mean for us? We have the responsibility to kind of be our own hero, and one of those ways that we can do that is sign up for Lookout Alert. Has anyone not heard of Lookout Alert? That is awesome. No one has not heard of it. So that means you're all signed up. See, everyone in this room represents the solution. What I want everyone here to do is ask your friends and family if they've heard of Lookout Alert. It's imperative to be signed up for these emergency notifications because during an incident, when seconds matter, we will be there in minutes. Let me say that again. When seconds matter, help will be there in minutes. It's not because we don't wanna be there, it's because it takes time to spin up resources and get to where the incident is. So the first line of defense that we have is the Lookout Alert system. So we can notify you. Now the Lookout Alert system is not perfect. It's not a silver bullet. We also have the wireless emergency alert capability through Jeffcom to send kind of like the Amber Alert system. I also recommend having an all hazards weather radio. Those are tried and true uh, notification systems that actually, uh, if you have them programmed to the county code, uh, it will self uh, alert, it will turn on by itself. If you have any uh, access or functional needs, you can hook up bed shakers to them, you can hook up a uh, strobe light to them, and, and in, a, in an emergency alert system notification, those all hazard weather radios will turn on, self-activate in the middle of the night, so you can get that information as quickly and as safely as possible. So again, it's not one thing, it's multiple things that you can do to be notified and stay alert. Um, so that's kind of the big picture of what we do. Um, you can find our information online. We have our kind of strategic framework of how we deal with all hazards online. Um, you know, we deal with wildland fire, cybersecurity, um, earthquakes, terrorism. Uh, Jefferson County is a very complex and very uh, amazing county. Um, but again, I always say with the blessings of a beautiful county like ours, we also inherit some of the responsibility and burden of that beauty. So I appreciate every one of y'all being here. 
to learn more. But again, I implore you to join me in making sure we share this information with those people that are not here represented by these empty seats around us. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot for a sec, Hal. Can, can you talk to the group, take a minute to talk to the group about weather stem and the station we have up here? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, um, so again, with the fire management office, one of the things that we've done is we've invested in a system called weather stem. Has anyone not heard of weather stem? Probably a lot more of y'all. So, um, so my, my fire management officer, Kenyon, come on out. Say hi to everyone. Say hi to Kenyon. Hi, Kenyon. So he's our... He's an evergreen resident. Um, he's been a firefighter for a long time. So I, I actually have two, de uh, two green shirts, we call them. I have two sworn that report within my office to me and a firefighter. So it's really cool. And I have a civilian staff person. So that's my entire team. Um, but what we do with WeatherStem is he, he's actually charged with taking samples, monitoring weather, and deciding and helping uh, recommend to the sheriff when we go into fire restrictions. And I want science to do that. Uh, historically, you know, back in the past, it's like, it's really dry. It's pretty hot today. Let's go into restrictions. Well, we're to the point now where I want more data. I want to be more scientific and precise with when we do or do not go into fire restrictions. So we actually, we funded four weather stem, S-T-E-M, weather stem units. And what these units do, it allows him to do uh, fuel moisture, uh, tracking weather analysis and lightning strike data so we can work with our fire districts to say hey we had some cloud to ground lightning in this area they can send out people to go look at those spots make sure there's not a smoldering fire or anything like that and additionally for you the data is not just ours you can access these weather stem units they have live looks in four different locations coal creek beaver ranch alder for three sisters um, and then we have one right on top of the Dakota building in the, uh, the government complex. And uh, you can actually Facebook, direct message the system, ask for the weather, it'll direct message you back. It's got AI, it posts automatically to Twitter, and it takes a uh, time lapse of all the, uh, the day. So it'll, it'll post a video, so it's really interactive. And if you can't spell meteorology like me, um, there's actually an activities uh, list you can put you know, you can do a drop down menu. It'll tell you if it's a good golf day. It'll tell you if it's a good hair day. Um, it'll, it'll actually make weather work for you. And so we're really excited. We're the first county uh, in the state to have this system uh, for public safety. And, uh, and it's in, we're integrating it with uh, numerous other stations. Hopefully it'll be going online in other jurisdictions. And it's hooked into IBM Watson. So the data of that station doesn't just represent the station data from the, the, the scientific instruments there. It actually plugs into IBM Watson, it pulls out the data, it monitors lightning data throughout the nation, and that's all free to, to check out for yourself. So if you're looking to go hiking, enjoy the day, um, you can see the weather um, for wherever you're going in the state or uh, outside. Hopefully that's good. Thanks, Hal. I appreciate that. Again, that's available to all of you. Um, next up, I want to introduce uh, Heather Gutherless. Heather is with our uh, planning and zoning team. She's going to talk to you about uh, what we're doing uh, relative to planning zone and zoning and building safety. Thanks, Tom. Today I get to talk about all of the regulatory items that Jefferson County Planning and Zoning and the Building Safety Division have in place currently and then also some things that we're looking at for the future. So first I wanted to talk about what we have in place currently. With planning and zoning, we have developed a wildfire hazard overlay district. We just recently changed the name of that with some updates, but this has actually been in place since 1995, so for about 27 years. And overlay districts, we have several of them in the county. They're areas that have specific regulations related to a specific physical constraint that exists in the county. So it's very specific to this area of the county that's above 6,400 feet in elevation. And that was established back in 1995 with the original regulation. The regulation mainly talks about building permits and what's required at the time that somebody comes in to get a building permit for a type of addition or a new home, something exterior to a structure. It doesn't include things like kitchen remodels or basement finishes, things like that. But if somebody comes in to do a new home or a new commercial structure, then we have certain requirements that say they, that they need to talk with a forester, 
that's on our, one of our lists and get defensible space done on the property. And that has to be done before the final certificate of occupancy is issued for that structure. Also in 1995, in addition to looking at the individual homes, we also passed regulations in our land development regulation that looked at broader, larger developments that might be proposed in the county. And that required a, ha a wildfire hazard mitigation plan within that overlay district for new residential subdivisions or any other type of developments that, are, that would be subject to the land development regulation. Again, this only applies to new developments, so it doesn't apply to the individual home. However, um, when somebody does that mitigation work, they do have to ha make sure that is done before the sale of any new lot. So that's something that is in an agreement with the developer as they go forward. So in addition to having the plan, they actually have to implement that plan before they can sell any lots. In regard to the individual homes, the Building Safety Division in 2020 adopted Appendix C of the International Building Code and the International Residential Code. And that appendix has regulations that really broadened the fire resistant related materials that need to be used on a home in the wildfire zone. So that before it focused more on roofing materials and with the Appendix C it focuses on other types of uh, parts of the home, such as the siding or the decking, soffits, looks at how maybe some hot embers might get into a home and how that can be mitigated so that buildings and structures are more fire resistant in the future. We did just update recently the wildfire regulations for planning and zoning. In our zoning resolution, we made some changes to the, the defensible space standards. We increased when defensible space is required, so increased it from an addition of over 400 square feet to any addition. We also included outbuildings and commercial structures having to get defensible space. That was done in January. And then just last week, the Board of County Commissioners approved regulation changes to expand defensible space to include driveways, on a property. We also changed the name of the district to the Wildland Urban Interface Overlay District to be more consistent with some other regulations that are out there. And we also modified landscape standards. The landscape standards, I do want to note, apply to larger developments that would have to come into the county and submit a landscape plan. It wouldn't apply to an individual getting a, a permit for their home. Staff does want to continue updating both building codes and the zoning resolution in our land development regulations. The building safety division is going to be looking at adopting the 2024 building codes in 2024. And with that work, we would be doing a lot of community outreach. And that's something that they have done in the past with the building codes updates, outreach to the fire marshal with the fire marshals including developers and contractors to make sure that everyone is aware of what would be updated the county also received a grant i know there's been lots of talks of talk about grants and w some of the money from some of the grants that we received are to update several county plans and regulations so we'll be updating the community wildfire protection plan which is really under house group but it is something that can really influence regulations that planning and zoning adopts. With that, we are, when the community wildfire protection plan is updated and the comprehensive master plan is going to be updated also, we wanna make sure that some of those items in those plans then get incorporated into our regulations, especially regarding our defensible space standards. We wanna make sure that those are the most current possible and then also we want to explore whether we should include the plains area of the county into the WUI, especially since what we saw last year with the Marshall Fire, although we were anticipating looking at that even before that occurred. So that was all I wanted to cover today about our regulations. We do have some handouts at the table if you want to discuss these further. Thanks, Heather. Uh, 
Next up is uh, some resources and programs that your local fire districts have. Uh, that would be uh, uh, Elk Creek and Inner Canyon, and we have uh, uh, Ben Yellen and, and John Mandel, and they're going to talk to you a few minutes about their programs. Gentlemen. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see all of you out here and, and interested in the safety of your community. Um, I'm going to be brief. Uh, we've got a lot to cover. Uh, first off, I'm going to say that if you go to either fire district's website, and that's intercanyonfire.org or elkcreekfire.org, and you click on the Wildland tab, it will take you to the same exact site, regardless of where you started, and it'll cover all of the, the programs and, and information we're going we're to give to you tonight. Um, one of the things that many of you know, a lot of familiar faces in the crowd here, is that when you see Captain Yellen, I'm probably a couple steps behind him, and if you see me, Captain Yellen's probably a couple steps behind me. We have been tied at the hip for several years now, uh, working together, collaborating, trying to bring um, just the resources of the two districts together to be more effective, more efficient with our wildland response, wildland training, everything that falls under that wildland umbrella. Um, we are very excited in that we have now included North Fork Fire Protection District into that realm. Um, so we, we, you might have heard the term Conifer Wildland Division. Um, that's kind of what we call the group working together. But keep in mind we are still three individual districts at this point, um, three individual budgets, three individual uh, members of, of separate districts. Um, what we're doing is we're collaborating, trying to get the best of everything that all the districts have to offer, working together to make things better for the communities overall. Um, so a lot of exciting stuff happening now with that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is our community ambassador program. They're, they've got the table set up here, the Elk Creek Intercanny Community Ambassadors. With our recent update of our CWPP, um, folks who have read it, have looked at it, know that the large district between Intercanyon and Elk Creek has been divided up into 46 what we're calling planning units. And our goal is to have an ambassador for each planning unit. Right now, we've got about 30 ambassadors that represent the different planning units. So there are still some out there that are unrepresented. Um, and what the ambassador does is they act as that conduit of information from the district to the community for fire mitigation, implementation of defensible space. Um, any questions that you might have regarding fire district uh, uh, topics, you can actually run through your, um, your ambassador. On our website, you'll see a page uh, tabbed on that Wildland page for the Ambassador Program. There is a map on there, and if your community, you, you, you can zoom in on the map, if your community has an ambassador, it'll have a little logo on there. You can click that. It'll tell you the information, contact information. will be an email. You can reach out to them if you don't have, uh, uh, if you're not in touch with them. They can pass along a lot of great information to you. If you get to your community and you do not have an ambassador, consider being one. We cannot give these guys enough credit for the amount of workload that they take off our plate. Right now with the, the expanded coverage that Captain Yellen and I are overseeing, we're looking at 400 square miles of district, just over 51% of the county. To have everybody from that area calling us up with questions about mitigation is unrealistic us educating the ambassadors in the communities and then being able to pass that information down to you at the community level is what it's all about. So if you don't have an ambassador in your community, please consider being one. Um, it's, it's, if you need more information on it, talk to the ambassadors who are doing it. They would be happy to, to get you going on it. And that's all I have. Hi, good evening everybody. It's a two for one special here. Um, so with all the talk of defensible space risk, you know, it's easy to get overwhelmed. We have pamphlets for defensible space. You can get research on, on in the internet, right? But it's really hard to apply to your property and the house itself. And so we've created the Wildfire Prepared Program to do exactly that. What you do is you get a, a, a expert to come out to your house, look at the house itself, get a defensible space marking, and then get a report that comes to about 23, 24 pages of work sometimes in order to get to a standard that we can then certify or give you a certificate of defensible space. Um, that is all done through a third party portal. All of your information stays safe. It is not actually um, 
subject to the Freedom of Information Act. So we're not gonna give it to anybody. Nobody can get that information. It is all your information and really just a work plan for you to do the best thing you can do for your house, your property. We obviously promote being your own forester. This area has a lot of open space, public lands, but it's also mostly developed. So we're gonna to have to rely on you to reduce that risk. So please use the Wildfire Prepared Program. It is a very popular program and we have limited resources. However, sign up, sign up now, get in that queue, and we'll get Kelly out there for you to get you that plan. Once you have that plan, it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work to get that material off your property. Um, one of our most popular programs is the community chipping program, which I hope many of you have used. Um, we've, thank you. <laughs> Um, we try and do our best to do as much chipping as possible. We do do landscape scale projects with the people who also implement that program. And so we get pulled in a lot of different directions. This year we did over 400 houses, um, which resulted in about a thousand cubic yards of chip material um, being removed from that developed area. Um, please sign up. Uh, it's gonna be in the middle of winter, um, so we can plan on what we use in terms of the groups that we have, all directed by the planning units to let you know where exactly we're gonna be. Um, it is a very large area. Um, we're working on how to expand that into North Fork without actually you know, taking that um, resource away from anything that we've done here. And so please, please, please sign up, follow us on all of our social media to know when that is actually happening. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, next up is uh, Matt uh, McLemore. He's with the Jefferson Conservation District. He's going to talk to you a little bit about their efforts. Matt? Thanks, Tom. Uh, like Tom said, I'm Matt McLemore with Jefferson Conservation District, and I'm going to give you a pretty quick presentation tonight, but <clears throat> if you're interested, you can view the full-length version of this on JCD's YouTube page. Um, I think it's the only video we have right now, so <laughs> should be pretty easy to find. Um, so JCD, like all conservation districts in the US, is a special district, a local form of government, like a fire district or a school district. Um, but we're a non-taxing district, meaning that <clears throat> most of our, we operate mainly through grants and fees for service. So it's a little confusing because of our name, but we are not the county, we are a separate entity. And we assist private landowners in Jefferson County <clears throat> and then a little bit into Southeast Clear Creek County and Northeast Park Counties. Uh, our primary programs are forestry and noxious weed management. And that's, we, we offer education, funding searches if needed, and uh, <clears throat> project planning and management services to implement those projects. So starting this year, we also partnered with Jefferson County to staff the slash collection program drop-off sites, which I'll touch on a little bit later in my presentation. So ecology is the foundation of JCD's program, and I wanna talk a little bit more about that just to give you an idea of what we do. Um, but I wanna be clear here that I'm talking about forests that are below 9,000 feet elevation, um, and the central thesis to that idea is that our forests have changed a lot since the mid to late 1800s when the gold rush era happened. Uh, so this photograph, which you've obviously been staring at for a little bit, uh, shows the same location in the county over 100 years apart, and you can really see the change there. At a very basic level, wildfire used to keep our forest in a more open and variable condition, and since we put those fires out, uh, the forest has now gotten very dense. So here's another picture. Um, it's from Bergen Park near Evergreen, taken, uh, <clears throat> painted in 1870. And again, you can note the lack of trees compared to the present day. So we have a very simple phrase we like to use to help divide the fire mitigation work into three categories, and that's our homes, our yards, and our forest. So like others have said tonight, preparing for the inevitable wildfire has to include home, harden home hardening, uh, the home, working on defensible space outside of the home, the yard, and then working in the broader forest 
beyond the, the yard. And when these really large and scary mega fires happen, people a lot of the time think that the fire is coming right up to your front door and causing your house to burn down. But in reality, that's, that's not the case. It's usually embers that are blown in from the broader forest as it burns. And so it's important to address not just defensible space and home hardening, but also those broader changes that have occurred in our, on our forest landscapes. And that's where JCD's forestry program comes in. We focus on that larger landscape scale. So a little bit more about our program. We try to target projects that are 40 acres and above. And this can be one property or several properties together. And our program is also designed for these larger, more complex projects that require heavy logging equipment and a lot of space. And sometimes where landowners can't or don't want to manage that type of project themselves. And I want to be clear here that <clears throat> the types of projects that we do manage aren't possible on every property because access and terrain are often very limited. So what does our approach to forestry look like? We're going to look at some common illustrations of <clears throat> removal or thinning alternatives. Um, let's see if I can get the pointer here. Yeah, so starting here on the left, we've got the current condition of the forest. And as you move left to right, each alternative removes more and more trees until you get to the parking lot option down here on the end. And obviously, that's not a realistic suggestion, but it just serves to illustrate that unless you remove all the vegetation, there's always going to be a risk of a fire. And again, starting here on the left and then moving to the right, things like crown fire, fire intensity, ember production, risk of, of <clears throat> loss of homes and trees, those all decrease the more trees that you cut. And then again, moving left to right, ecological benefits increase as you move left to right on this. So you're going to get better ecological function and native plant communities and wildlife habitat. So <clears throat> for those reasons, because of the risks are less and the benefits are greater, JCD takes the ecological restoration approach. And I, I want to emphasize again that a restoration approach can manifest itself in different ways in different forest types, which can include patch cuts or clear cuts, especially in lodgepole pine dominated forests. Um, but those are ecologically appropriate treatments. There's a lot of great publications out there that synthesize the research that supports a forest restoration approach to forest management. And if you're interested in learning more about those, you can ask me about them later on. Um, and again, there, there's just a ton of social and ecological benefits to this work. Native plant communities are, are better off, wildlife habitat, and just reduced risk across the board. So a quick timeline for JCD projects. We split them into a planning phase and an implementation phase. The planning phase typically takes one to two years and includes a more thorough educational process and a funding search if needed. And then the implementation phase is the active forestry operations, and those can take anywhere from six to 12 months. And again, these, these projects are not possible on every property because of those access and terrain limitations. So starting this year, the uh, JCD partnered with Jefferson County to staff the slash collection drop-off sites. And <clears throat> there's a few major benefits to that, which included the, an increase in the number of collection days and then increasing the consecutive day, weekends in the same location. And that allowed the efficiency of the program to increase pretty drastically. We saved costs on moving equipment and fuel. Uh, it also allowed us to increase the amount of volume of material we've collected. So there's been a 19% increase to date. Uh, compared to last year's program, and there are still three weeks left. So if you haven't gotten to work, go ahead and fire up that chainsaw and get to, get to town. <laughs> uh, for more info on that program, you can check out the county's table over here or the, the website. Uh, so thanks very much for having me, and I really appreciate everyone being here. This is a super important I issue, and um, again, I'll be around to talk more if you need. Thanks, Matt, and thanks to the Conservation District for uh, the partnership on our SLASH program. It's really worked out tremendous this year, and you all have done an incredible job um, increasing by almost 20% the amount that we collected this year versus last. Um, I want to just spend one minute talking about um, 
our fuel reduction work on Jefferson County open space parks. Uh, we have a number of locations where we have done work recently and we continue to uh, look at doing work. Um, we have some maps over on the table. I'd invite you to come over and talk with us about that. And just recently, our, the Board of County Commissioners um, approved an update to our forest health plan. That was about a, an 18 to 24 month process collaborating with lots of different experts and organizations, uh, really a good prescription for the work that we need to do on Jeffco open space properties uh, over the next coming years. Um, so with that and in the interest of time, I just want to spend the final minute and introduce uh, Chiefs uh, Ware and Sherlaw uh, from uh, Elk Creek and Inner Canyon Fire Protection Districts to talk to you about uh, consolidation. Chiefs. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for being here. We want to thank the Conifer Area Council for putting this meeting on tonight. I think we can all agree this is definitely one of the most important topics that we're all concerned with in the neighborhood. My name is Skip Sherl. I'm the Chief of Inner Canyon. Uh, Chief Kurt Rogers from North Fork wanted to be here with us this evening, but he is a little ill. And uh, Chief Ware is going to be talking in a minute as well. Um, I think what's pretty amazing that we see tonight is a lot of collaboration. Pretty much every single speaker up here this evening, we all work together. We all work together, emails, meetings, and we're all working towards the same effort or the same goal. We're all working on this problem. We're trying to solve this problem together. And for me, in my career, that's pretty unique and that's new, that we're working so well in a collaborative effort. And as you heard Tom say, we're gonna talk a little bit about consolidation. And you may be wondering why we would need to consolidate, why we'd even be considering it. Well, North Fork, Elk Creek, and Inner Canyon are looking at this for a few reasons. One of them that's driving it is a loss of volunteers. As you probably have heard, volunteerism is down throughout the country, and we feel that same effect in our fire districts. But one of the bigger efforts we're trying to do is improve service. We are already working on that. You heard a little bit of that tonight with the Conifer Wildland D Division and some of the work that they're doing. We do a lot of training internally together through EMS or fire and responses. We share a lot of services where we can. So we are working towards the potential for consolidation down the road, trying to improve that service. And I know that we're up against the time limit here, so I'll, I'll let Chief Ware talk a little bit, and then uh, I don't think we're gonna get our interpretive dance stuff done, so. I think you're okay. All right, no. All right, Deputy Fisher was gonna do it, but I guess she's bowing out. I'm Jacob Ware, I'm the Fire Chief with Elk Creek Fire Protection District, and as Chief Sherlaw said, everything that has been talked about tonight has been done through partnerships, and the more collaboration that we work on, the better. We've been working on consolidation and talking about it for probably about the last three years. Kind of time frame, about two years ago, we started looking at a consulting firm to even decide if it was feasible. About a year ago, we had the report from the consultant. Uh, we've got it all up on our websites. It's 278 pages talking about, you know, a deep dive into all of our districts, if it's feasible, if it makes sense. That actually recommended that we should move forward and start exploring it. Fast forward to where we are now, we are retaining the services of a research firm and a survey firm to start reaching out to you, the community. So what I'd like to talk about right now, real quick, before I get the, uh, the card back there, is over the next couple months, we're gonna be sending out a survey. As Captain Mandel talked about, we're talking about 400 square miles and approximately 24,000 people. We have to retain somebody who's actually good at communicating with this group. We can't do it on our own. We're good at a lot of things, but that is not what we do. So our goal is to get a survey out to every person within that district. And I would encourage you, keep an eye out over the next two months for this survey. The feedback from the community is what's gonna drive this project. The community is what's driven everything we've done so far with the Wildland Division, Wildfire Prepared, all of our programs. And now the community is going to drive the rest of this as well. So it's going to be critically important. And I know we're all inundated between your extended warranty on your car, all kinds of stuff coming in the mail. But this is a local survey that we're putting out. So please keep an eye out for it. We're going to push everything out through our social media, 
My Mountain Town, every avenue that we have once this gets sent out. And it's, I'd really encourage everybody, just take five minutes. I think the goal from the, uh, Mark, the, uh, the research firm was what, 10 minutes? 10, ideally, it, yeah. yeah there's, so it shouldn't take more than 10 minutes to actually fill out this survey. So I encourage you, keep an eye out for it. And with that, I'm probably gonna wrap up. Thanks everybody for coming. The, uh, oh, Chief? Just in regards to that, sorry, just thought uh, I'm gonna talk more. Um, we are looking for individuals who'd be interested in meeting with this company. Um, one on one to have maybe a little bit longer interview. If you are for it, against it, they wanna talk to anybody. So if you are interested, we would need your email if you wouldn't mind finding Chief Ware or myself after and letting us know, we'd appreciate that. And now we're done. Unless you wanna see dance. Yeah, I want. Well, dang, I thought I had a chance. <laughs> oh, come on, you can do it. <laughs> okay, well, I just want to thank all of our speakers tonight. Um, they're all amazing in what they do. Um, they are collaborating. Um, everybody that's here, there we have service providers, we have the community ambassadors, we have Core Electric who um, is you know talking about what they're doing um, to mitigate wildfire. Um, there's just a lot of people here that are doing amazing things. So please talk, stay and talk to them. But before we end, I just want to introduce. I know you've heard about all kinds of surveys tonight, but we are launching the Conifer Area Council 2022 Claiming Conifers Character Survey tonight. Um, and what we've done in the past, we, our first survey was done in 2006, we did one in 2010, 2014, 2018, and now 2022. Um, what we've seen is a pattern of what people want for this community. And the pattern continues. The information from these surveys goes out to every single person you have seen tonight. It goes to all of the county offices, the commissioners, the planning and zoning department, open space, everybody. Um, it's, it's critical if you wanna have your voice heard. You know, we don't have a town up here really. So if you want your voice heard, this is, this is really a good way to do it. The um, survey this time, if you just answer the questions, will probably take you just 10 minutes, but there's a lot of great information. So if you, you know, there's a question about the Conifer Loop Access Plan. And you're going, well, I don't know what that is. Well, there's an explanation about it. There's an explana explanation about the consolidation that the fire departments were just talking about. So please, please, please fill out that survey. If you are not on our email list, you can get on there and you will receive it. You will also receive the link to this town hall meeting, this community or wildfire symposium, and you'll also be getting information about all town hall meetings that we have that are quarterly. The next one is November 16th. It's a Wednesday night. It covers a lot of topics. Um, but gosh, we would invite you all to come to that. But again, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Please stick around and talk to everyone. Um, there's so much valuable information here that you can take home. Um, and just thank you for coming so much. It makes, makes us realize that this is a special community and we all care about our community. Thank you.